Heath, this has to be the first Tarana I've been in many years that actually feels like it goes around a corner all right. Yeah, it does a pretty good job of that. Yeah. Nice and flat and uh, pretty tight. So for us old folk who grew up as teenagers in the 90s, we are obsessed with magazines like Tirana Power. And these were the sorts of cars you'd see in there, and this is really a homage to that era, isn't it, Heath? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I wasn't actually alive when those magazines were coming out, but I still grew up buying the old mags and loving all that shit, all the colour match wheels, the crazy colours and everything like that. They're really loud visual cars, and yeah. that's, of course, where I drew my inspiration from. Yeah, and this has been a build over the best part of a decade, yeah? Yeah, correct. Yeah, quarter of my life was yeah. pointed out to me recently. So I started it in late 2014, yeah. so eight years before I took it to Summonats and got it in the Elite Hall at the start of this year. You know, we're mid-year now, so I've done a few more things to it to it since to um, just make it work a bit better and stuff like that. It's a ever-evolving thing, but I'm pretty close to having it resolved, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, probably the two most favourite models are the, the what you call probably an Alex hatchback. Yep. Or a... LCLJ two-door. Two-door, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But this one is prop started life off as probably the not the most desirable of the bunch, yeah? That's right, yeah, yeah. This is a UC Sunbird originally. Yeah. So definitely the least desirable one, the, the unloved. They, they made, made them in high volumes, yeah. but certainly not a desirable model. They, this being a Sunbird was a four-cylinder. They still had a UC Tirana, which looked yeah. the same. That had a 202 or a 173 in it. When I bought this car, it had a 202 swapped into it, but, you know, my mates will never forget the the badge that it came with originally. So yes, it's a sunbird or, or a shitbird as they, as they tell me. <laughs> A time capsule car for me. <laughs> this is exactly what I wanted when I was in high school. Yeah, well, same for me. V8 this is, Holden's um, one. Yeah, this is always the dream for me. I had a LX sedan when I was 14 that I bought. That was my first car, and uh, the dream was always to go for something that was a bit more serious. V8 hatchback, you know, the iconic flared look, and yeah, yeah certainly the way that I enjoy cars is driving them quick around corners. I love all the twisty roads around here. Nice elevation changes and nice scenery. I made this car, you know, in a way that, that suits that kind of operation. So that's got, you know, a lot of attention to the, to the suspension and the dynamics of the car. I just love this area. You know, this is a local haunt for my mates and I, and the car really, really suits these kind of roads. It's small enough to, to be good on narrow roads and, geared appropriately, nice and stiff, lots of camber and caster and all the good shit that makes a, a car really fun and rewarding and kind of effortful to drive, like a lot of feedback. I kept the manual steering, uh, yeah, a lot of caster in the front suspension, a lot of camber gain, manual brakes with no booster, yeah. just maximum kind of feedback for the driver. Converting it to this body shape, it's not impossible, but it's not that easy, is it? So the LHLX Tirana and the UC, they, they share the centre section for the most part. The hatchback and the sedan are both pretty much the same from the firewall to near the tail lights. And with this one, I cut the front off so it was uh, just the chassis rail sticking forwards of the firewall. I made smoother versions or used a front cut. I kind of made a bit of a hybrid front end so that I could put the LX sheet metal on, different bumper, nose cone, headlights, etc. The dash frame is different, so I cut that out. Yeah. That's actually the hardest bit of okay. the job just because of access. So I put an LX Tirana uh, frame in it. Well, how is it different? So the the actual metal frame that the dashboard bolts to is totally different in yeah. shape. So, well, actually, one of the things that's kind of interesting about these is when they build the car, they start off with the dash and the firewall and they cap it all. So you can't get those panels out oh. without cutting them in 
two, okay. actually. People don't really think about yeah. that, but that is the first bit of sheet metal that goes together on a car. So I cut the trans tunnel out to make it bigger for the bigger TKO 600 gearboxes that's in there. I got rid of the centre pull handbrake because I think they're ugly. Yeah. I put it back to a foot mechanical ratchet park brake like a standard LHLX, but it's got a hydraulic handbrake oh, right. as well. So that's really good for you know track use. So it's got a yeah different bit of sheet metal through there. False floor in the back being a hatchback, I changed the height of that, so I cut that out and put it at a different height and did the tail lights. And that's pretty much most of the u to LX conversion. That actually didn't take that yeah. long compared to, well, in the scheme of the whole build. Yeah. The, the colour scheme and everything, is this what you had in mind or did it just change as you built it or? Yeah, that actually did change. So originally it was going to be, I, I bought the car, it had a nice black paint job and I was intending to just keep a nice black paint job yeah. on it after the, the restyle. Um, I wanted to have like a bright orange roll cage and I actually wanted to target top it, like cut the whole oh, way right. through. Yeah. yeah, so do it pretty kind of visually loud, but only with a black. I still have some kind of graphical stri stripe in orange, but just to have a, yeah, a gloss black paint. But I'm not that much of a detailing enthusiast and I went off the idea of having any more than that amount of black. <laughs> and I, I really, I, I guess I started to appreciate the original Tirana colours from the 1970s. So this is called Ultra Blue. This is a factory colour. Okay. You could get this on a LX A9X Tirana if you, if you wanted it back in the day. You could even get it with the fashion pack interior, yeah. but it would have been a blue and green one. Not. So is that an OE style interior? It is, yeah. Uh, Obviously the seats at Recaro yeah, LXCs, yeah. they're different, but that particular material is new old stock fashion pack, okay. which was a, an unusual option uh, from GMH. It, it, it suits the blue so well, I love it. Like most Tiranas, you know, or Holdens, they might have a houndstooth style interior, but you rarely see colourful interiors Correct. that aren't, you know, just glary leather or... Exactly, yeah. yeah. The, just... the LHLX Tiranas, are, they mostly just have grey inserts and the houndstooth is in the earlier models. I love the houndstooth as well, I think that's fantastic, but I just wanted more kind of, you know, visual arresting kind of kind of kind of colorway with it but you've got essentially you've got four colors on the car and it all works so well blend um, mated to these wheels yeah. yeah yeah the the car is very consistently colored like all of the badges and the stickers and everything every part of the car is within that four colors plus polished metal type stuff so it's, i've tried to exercise that you know even the way that the dashes are the dash is graphically designed i drew up all the, that and made it all you know papaya color to match that, that palette that I had going on. And these wheels, you said they were, they're 12 inches wide. They are, yeah, correct. So they're a Panasport G7 C5R. They're a Japanese motorsport wheel. I love, you know, Japanese three-piece wheels. They were built by Barrel Bros, actually. I didn't build those myself. They're painted in ultra blue to match the car, and they used to be 16 by sevens and eights. Now they are 16 by tens on the front and 17 by 12 on the back with a, you know, a much bigger lip. Like they never had any kind of aggres aggression in the sizing before, but now they, they're rebuilt to, to my exact specs to, to fill the flares up. So one question I've had about the flares that I've never actually asked someone with a Tirana is there's two different versions. Yeah. Some of them look bigger. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, yeah, good question. There is a thing called an A9X flare, which is wider than the front flare. So an L34 has the same width or the same angle, front and rear. So if you look down the car, they'll kind of line up. An A9X one's, one is wider on the back. Oh. So I guess that every, flare, every hatchback one is probably an A9X one, but these have been so molested over the years with moulds and different companies making them and stuff. I don't know what is what. Yeah. They're not like an extra big one. They're just the standard that you buy for a hatchback now. Is there anything original on the car? From when it was a UC? Yeah. It still has the doors that it had. It had a GDS steering wheel. I sometimes have that GDS steering wheel in it. And the glove box hinges. They're all full of holes. I'm on track to do more than 10,000 Ks in the first year of having this car on the road, yeah, wow. which is obviously a lot more than the average street machine-y kind of car that's getting built nowadays. Yeah, so this thing's got shockworks, monotube dampers all around. They've been tuned, like the car has had its suspension tuned by, by Chris at Shockworks. And, you know, that's one of the most satisfying things that I've had done to the car since getting it on the road is just getting the body control as good as, it, as good as it is. It's obviously quite a stiff car, like body structure wise and 
spring rate wise. But I think the ride quality is fantastic for the kind of, um, you know, B road work that I like to put it through. I have to say, for an older car, Heath, it handles very, very good. Everybody who's come in the car has said the same thing. <laughs> the standard Tirana dynamic is pretty different to this. The front end is not that modified. It's kind of just tinkered with in a few ways, with a few little geometry changes, you know, a lot more car stuff. I've moved the front end forward in the, in the chassis of the car. I've got a lot more camber gain on bump and stuff like that. So you were saying you've done a bit of work in the rear end? Yeah, the rear end's been modified in a more dramatic way. So they typically have a, like a Tirana's come with this triangulated four link arrangement. It's, it's a real compromise to suit seat packaging without having the extra link of a Panhard bar or a, or a Watts link. So they, they put the upper arms on this angle towards the center. So they kind of do the lateral location of the diff as well as the normal thing that trailing arms do, just controlling the up and down and, and rotation. Yeah. And I got rid of that system. The standard system has a very high roll center. The roll center moves around as you load the car up in different ways. So if you go, you know, put, put a lot of cornering force into it, it moves to the, to the wrong side and it's just really inconsistent. It makes it hard to drive the car on the limit with any kind of confidence. Yes. Uh, so what I've done is I replaced those upper links with a wishbone, basically the same as like it's just like a bigger version of what you have in the front of a of a double A arm, double wishbone car. It's got a ball joint on the back of the pumpkin of the diff. Yeah. So it's got a back brace across the diff to strengthen the axle tubes, and it's got a ball joint that fits into that area, and that gives it the lateral location, and it does the job of torsional resistance of the diff when you dump the clutch and everything like that when you put the drive force through it but it keeps it really really tightly very very consistently located and I've also brought that roll center down quite a long way by doing that yep. so it's night and day difference there, there, there are probably more radical things you could do to a Tirana you could put a big three link in it with a watts linkage but uh, you'd have to eat into the rear seat space. This is still a four or five seat car if you're really keen, and I didn't want to get rid of that feature. Obviously some of the older Holdens, you'd see them with the old pop-up style sunroof, but they never came out with anything this at this magnitude. Yeah, exactly right. I actually quite like those dorky yeah. pop-up ones, just because yeah. they're a cool kind of thing from the era. But from that era. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so they never had anything, you know, you can tell if you've got a factory sunroof because it's got a flush kind of arrangement. It doesn't have a, a rubber seal that sticks oh, up, yeah. right? So this is a factory style, but of course, Tirana's never came with a sunroof. This is actually made with Porsche 944 hardware. Oh. So the deflector at the front, which is spring loaded and the latches and the sump kind of drain mechanism or not mechanism, you know, the sheet metal for that is, uh, I, I got a roof cut of a Porsche 944 and I actually worked with Peter Tomasini. I spent a summer building that sunroof and we made a new lid out of aluminium. So we actually wheeled that up on the English oh, wheel. So I could have actually made this sunroof longer or shorter because I did end up making a new lid, but I kept it pretty much the same size as the, as the Porsche one was. So I made up, like I fabricated a new aluminium frame. I kept the interior trim piece that's like a kind of vinyl, you know, covered thing on the underside, like a, like a door trim, but a sunroof trim. And uh, I use the same hardware. So it all sits flush. It's got a little seal there, but it, nothing sticks proud. So if you look at it from a lower down angle when the sunroof is installed, you don't see that it's got a sunroof at all. Yeah. And of course, when you want to open it, you can pop it at the back. Oh, so it sticks, nice. it sticks up about two and yeah. a half or three, yeah. um, three inches at the back. And uh, that's great, you know, there's no noise or anything like that. Actually, with it, even with it fully open, there's no noise. No, well, we just went for a drive and you can hear there's noise above you, but it's not Yeah, it's not a problem. There's anything. no like buffeting. No. Or, and you've got the sunroof in Correct. the boot, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'll show you where it stows. It's got the false floor 
that folds up like that. So that stows there. Underneath there, you've got some more boot space and that's where the LPG tank is. And I just made that area when it was, when I had it on the rotisserie, I just made all those little oh, pads. So you've, you've, done, you've done pretty much everything on this car, have you? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, every weld in the car was me. The paint work was laid down. I was working, I was doing body work with a fella called uh, Josh Bohm. So he actually painted it while I was in Melbourne lockdown. I couldn't even be there when the paint yeah. went on, but we did the, the body work collaboratively. I did a lot of work getting the fiberglass panels to you line up half reasonably. Okay, it's it's not a so it's not front, a perfect. The front paint. guards are fiberglass. Yeah, the front guards are fiberglass. The bonnet, the bonnet scoop, bumpers, and this hatch lid is also fiberglass. And of course, the spoilers front and rear as well. And it's got brake ducts and stuff like yeah. that. And then the uh, the sunroof is aluminium. So this is just a um, a three D printed shape that I made up, and I made it look like the dash print on there. It's got a voltage gauge. It's got an SS badge on there just to make it look like it's part of the car and it's got your, you know, your cigarette light out, outlet and your phone charger for when you're putting your uh, mattress in the back and sleeping in it. All right, let's get to the business end because cool. uh, <laughs> you took me for a ride in it before and she's got a bit of poke. But one thing I liked about this car, Heath, we, we go on a lot of cars on full boost, but this is, it's quick, but it's quiet for an old car. Most old cars, I don't know, autos, diff gears, they're just non-stop noise. You can barely have a conversation in there. Hmm. But this was, you know, we had the windows down, the roof open, no problem talking. Yeah, I didn't really know how good or bad it was going to be when I was building it, but uh, it's got a, you know, a stainless exhaust on it that's got a big expansion chamber and then two mufflers, so it still kind of screams a bit when you're really Is on it. Is it twin, but twin system? Or? Yeah, it's twin system, twin two and a half with tri wise And the car does have insulation in it. Like, I've been very weight conscious with it, but it still has a lot of foam insulation. It doesn't have like shit loads of big asphalt panels because they're just heavy. But I've tried to be quite strategic with how I've done that stuff. And yeah, the the kind of ride noise is pretty comfortable. It's pretty isn't comfortable, it? yeah. Because yeah. like the roads we're on weren't exactly quiet roads. Correct, you know? they're yeah. They're very noisy. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of lumps and bumps and yeah. shit like that. But the car kind of handles that so well, and you don't seem to have many. I don't know, whistles and squeaks no. and stuff. It, it's very well, tight. Yeah, I think one of the things there is that, like if you have a car that's quite a flexible shell and the doors move around and stuff over bumps, that would be a cause of a lot more noise than you'd be used to. This has a lot of chassis strengthening in it. So I've cut a lot of weight out of the car. It's got holes in everything. It's got 1300 lightning holes and stuff like that. It's really radically weight reduced, but it actually, does have a bunch of weight that I've added with chassis strengthening. So chassis connectors, a tail shaft loop, which is a box section which connects the left and right chassis rail. All of the mounts for the suspension are braced to one another. So it's, it, it actually has quite a lot of, you know, it's all stitch welded and shit mm. like that as well. So, so I think that probably helps, the rigidity probably helps the noise a bit as well. So why the orange engine bay? Just 80s baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> more visually arresting, I guess. But no, I really just love that era of, of shit that's loud with colour and it's also a very Japanese thing. It just sort of it looks like the old sort of touring car era, doesn't it, with the, exactly. the trumpets and... Yeah, exactly, yeah. Historic touring cars that have the big aluminium airbox and stuff like that, I really love that shit as well. So it was a good way to bring in, you know, awesome induction sound, actually having a filtration system for proper road use. So tell us a bit about the engine itself. What's the cubic capacity? Is it a roller block or? Yeah, I mean, it's not the most impressive part of the car, but it's a, it's a Holden uh, VN VR type yeah. block. So it's got a splayed four bolt main conversion. It's got a Cum Racing nodular iron 383 crank, I-beams with probe 4Gs. It's got untouched uh, Cum Racing 600 series alloy heads, so VN style. Heads. The intake manifold was made for Webers. I don't know the brand that makes that one, but EFI Hardware actually put together that that whole kit. I had it ceramic coated and mm -hmm. polished all the fins and everything like that to give it a bit more of an old school look. But it's a Weber manifold with 50 millimeter downdraft, yeah, IDA style um, EFI throttle bodies. It has a winged and trapdoored sump. It's got a few oiling modifications, which I'm continuing to work on. They are a bit of a an Achilles heel of these motors, as I'm sure you know already, and I am not through them all yet. <laughs> How's the old uh, remade seal going in this? It's all, it's all Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Have you looked under the car? <laughs> I don't know if it's the rear cam plug 
or the rear main that's leaking, but I have a hell of a oh. leak. It's, it's a shocker. <laughs> but yeah. it has to come out anyway. It's got a little exhaust leak, yeah. and I need to build a new sump for it anyway. The capacity is not enough. It needs to have external drain backs for the oiling. I've started off the car by driving on road tyres, on the road, then on the track on road tyres, then on the track on track tyres, and every time you, you know, you up it, you find more problems. Yeah. And that's just what it was gonna be like with a motor like this. The, the windage of the high cubes, the stroker, I think that probably works against you. They're just inherently a shithouse motor for, you know, oil return and they oil, do oil management. Yeah, Holden engine sound fantastic. I completely agree, yeah. that's why I have one. Yeah. Big difference on this, obviously you're running- LPG. LPG. God's fuel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's dedicated LPG, vapor injection. So it's got a Haltech, Elite 2000 that's running it, and it's got twin outlets at the tank, twin lines the whole way to those twin Prins billet converters, and they run into fuel rails like a conventional fuel injected car. So I don't have any of those like plastic manifolds and stuff like that. It's got extruded aluminium fuel rails. It's like it's a deadhead system with a balance bar there, and each converter runs into each rail kind of thing. So it's like it's, it's got two fully different, completely different fuel systems, and then they equalize at the front there. Yeah, and this part here looks beautiful, Heath. It looks, yeah. You know, it looks like one, not that it is, but look, it looks like one enormous radiator, but it's such a nice use of space. You know, you're not having, putting tanks Correct. down where the guards are and. Yeah, well, I, I really hate the look of the back of headlights in old cars, because you always see them when you're having a good look around the car. So I wanted to conceal them, but I haven't, like, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's, there's no real concealing panels on the car. I don't want to have anything that's single purpose is just to cover something. Yeah. I, I just, idealis, ideologically, that's just not what I'm into. So I wanted functional things to cover the back and what need a way to do it than to fold something else that just continues that, that section of the top tank of the radiator out. So I just, you know, made them out of cardboard first and over quite a lot of time, they weren't that easy to make folded them up into aluminium ones. I've got the pump for the washer jet hidden in there. So that's the washer tank there. That's the overflow. That's of course the radiator. And then there's the catch can over there with a vent in or a filter that goes into the now sealed up wheel space okay. kind of thing. So it's got inner guards there, but yeah. the filter is you know, out of sight. Yeah, the thing is, Tiranas aren't as light as people think. So this car is 1300 on the nose with a um, with a quarter tank of fuel. Yep. Keep in mind, it's got a heavy fuel tank in it. It's got a much better weight bias. What does that hold, that tank? It's got a, it's 110 litres of water, which means it's about 88 litres of LPG. Okay. And the cruise economy is pretty good. It sits at 2200 on the highway. And uh, look, honestly, I think I can get the cruise economy a little bit, a little bit better, but uh, the range is okay. Yeah. But if you're flogging it through the hills, you know, that's different. You can easily halve your, well, you, you'd know well. If you're, using, if you're using 500 horsepower, you can, of, yeah. of course, use a lot of fuel to So to this is a that. bit like uh, E85, where even an electric car, there's a bit of a range anxiety issue <laughs> there, isn't it? Because yes, you don't know is. where you're going to fill up. Well, that's true, particularly when you go interstate. Yeah. yeah. It's like I'm going to race this car at Bathurst and do a big driving trip oh, wow. where I'm camping in the car. Yeah. Um, late, I think in, in November we're doing this big one and we're going through uh, out through Malakuta, like out through Gippsland and out through Malakuta up the coast a bit through Eden and yeah. some nice uh, driving roads around uh, ACT and stuff. You got to plan that stuff out. You know, if you want to do Threadbow or something, there are some areas that you just cannot do with LPG. It, I'm sure you could at some point, but nowadays it, it, it's a bit sparse, which is a pain in the ass, but at least I got the big tank. That's why I cut yeah. the floor out, put the giant tank in there so that I could at least have some pretty good touring ability. So why, uh, why LPG then? It's just a fuel type that I like. I like dry fuel, it's neat and tidy, it doesn't smell. Um, you don't get the kind of cold start richness uh, that you know, it promotes more engine wear and stuff like that. I, I, I've always just found it appealing. I like the idea of a car that you can, you know, run indoors without it stinking out the joint and stuff like that from an emissions perspective, both legally and just from a, you know, human comfort perspective, I like it. So yeah, it was always going to be the way. And that was how I had my first Tirana as well, yeah. which was just a six cylinder. 
Um, I did have that on, on LPG as well, which I, which I quite liked. Finding information on dedicated vapor LPG stuff is really hard to do. Obviously, Jason at Tunnel Vision has done a few cars with that fuel system, but I, I doubt that he's done one in the last six years other than this car. It's, yeah. it's not a popular fuel yeah. type at all. Which is a bit of a shame in Australia. I think it's a real shame. I think it's a great, it's a great fuel. It's a fuel that Australia can be self-sufficient with manufacturing, which you know, you can't say that so much about anything else that we're running with and certainly not with electric or anything like that. I mean, we're not, uh, we're not making any of that stuff in Australia. So I think it's, it's bloody unfortunate that it didn't really stick on. The first car I owned was a VC Commodore. It had an M20 four-speed manual. You know, you couldn't put it in first gear really without stopping. It's a pretty awful thing. And then I remember the- and you can easily get two gears at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the Tiranas had, I think it was at the M21. Uh, the no, M still M20. Was it M20, yeah, M20. It? And this is, that's what this car had when right. I got it. Originally it would have been an MC6 because it was a shitbird. <laughs> so that was the Filipino gearbox. But when I got it, it had the 202 M20 combo in it. So same, same as your Commodore. So what have we got now? I think you said it was a TK. TKO, yeah. yeah, so it's a Tremec aftermarket gearbox. They make them, I guess they started making them for people, turbocharging Mustang, yeah. V8, uh, Fox Body Mustangs in the, in the States and shit like that. So it's a five speed gearbox, alloy casing, but massive, like quite wide gears. The 600 denotes the torque capacity, so 600 foot pounds of okay. rated torque capacity. Yeah. It's a pretty big gearbox. It's not as big as a six speed. Mm. I, I chose the five speed for the weight. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely adequate for, like the motor makes 500 horsepower okay. or um, 325 kilowatts at the rear hubs. That's and it's good. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. fine for yeah. that. And it's just got a big 11 inch single plate organic clutch in it. It's got a hydraulic, you know, concentric mm -hmm. throw out. I made my own under dash hydraulic pedal box kind of thing with the master that's all hidden up. So you can't see much except for the little motorcycle reservoir um, there in black. It works beautifully. It's got a really tall overdrive. It's got a 0.64 overdrive. And I love the idea of having short gearing and then having the big overdrive. Yeah, yeah. I loved it until I drove it. If I had my time again, I would have gone a more consistent ratio spread because this motor is so strong down low yeah. that you just go for, it's got a three nine diff gear as well. You go for fifth all the time, but that's not a very exciting way to drive through the hills. Mm. So if you had a better ratio spread, you, it'll be better on the track when you're going, you know, 200 plus, because you can keep it on the boil a bit more before fifth. So it's got a massive jump between fourth and fifth. Huge, yeah, yeah exactly. So it's kind of like what everybody would have designed as the ideal, but when you drive it, I don't think it's that much of a perfect solution. If all you did was drag race and drive on the highway, perfect. Yeah, okay, I see what you mean. So you've had the car on the road about a year now, Heath. You're saying you've been doing a few motor carners. Yeah. You obviously love steering it. You took me for a drive earlier, and yeah, handles amazing, goes well, super quiet, no noise, like very tight car. Mm -hmm. What's the future plans for it? To yeah. me, it's pretty much perfect. If I was going to buy or build a Tirana, I don't think there's really anything on this I'd change. I think I've hit the target on a lot of areas. There are a few things that, or there are many things that you get wrong when you're building it. Mm. And a lot of those things I've, I've fixed it along the way, right? Yeah. So like it hasn't just been, boom, it's how it is now. Like you rework things as you do them and stuff. The only things left to rework is the oiling system. Like it's just not keeping up with track work with sticky tires. It's fine on the road tires. Fix some oil leaks, get some better luggage retention. So it's better for those touring drives where you got to do your camping gear and stuff like that. I don't want it to be sliding around in the back and there's nowhere to put your beer and your tools without them moving around. So that needs to be improved. Yeah. Bit of, you know, interior space stuff. Uh, I probably want to do a drag challenge. So I'll oh, yeah. put some sticky tires on the back at some point. I'm not really a huge drag racer, but yeah. be a, it looks like a really fun event. It's a fun so. week, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so not, things like that. That's not even about the actual racing, it's the... Yeah, the camaraderie yeah, and the vibe the and everything, the Marvo, yeah. 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 yeah, but it's great to see this is far from a garage queen, considering how much obviously time and money and effort you've put into it. And uh, thanks for uh, taking us for a spin. Thank you very much. If you haven't seen our collection of 90s retro merch yet, what are you doing? We have many different styles on offer in both tees and hoodies, so grab one today. He just missed his wheelie. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> 13B. <laughs> <laughs>
just standard. Oh. I don't think we ever do a photo shoot more Without than 15, mi 15 minutes where there's some something going on in the background where you're like, damn, I wish I filmed that. Showing off how much I didn't clean the uh, windscreen. Well, yeah, I what mean, have it, got now? It, what's going on? Well, as as you do, <laughs> as you do while you're filming, there's a steam train in the background. <laughs> All the sights and sounds of the hills. Isn't it funny? Like I never noticed sunbirds or tyrannos on the road until today. I've seen like four of them. Shitloads of them. Yeah, yeah, it's good as. Oh, there we go. You got the green lights on the back of the truck. <laughs> Sorry. It's hard to fathom this. We're back in the mid '90s. I remember my, a mate of mine had a, you know, stand, uh, an XF on Albert G. Pretty common back then. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember we filled up once for nine cents a litre. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the days, mate. <laughs>